Can you get started? Uh, I don't want to break the record of keeping this on time <laughs> and on focus. So welcome to the afternoon session uh, for the ILR uh, workshop. And we're going to hear from three great speakers this afternoon. And you have their bios and all in your, in your paperwork. So I'm not going to read through them. I'll just introduce our first speaker, who I think in, for many people needs no introduction. But uh, Catherine Bain from ALAC will be our first speaker. Catherine. And I will be working to keep people on time. Good afternoon. It really is a pleasure and a privilege to be among so many distinguished speakers. I have learned so much today. I apologize I was not able to be here yesterday, but um, I feel quite humbled in being among such august company. So um, that means my presentation is going to be less um, intellectual, I think, than the ones you've been hearing, and hopefully you'll find some pragmatic aspects to it. I'm a believer in um, not reading the last page of a novel that I'm reading. I don't want to know what the outcome is when I'm reading my book. I want to enjoy it. But in a case like this, I am going to be the spoiler and say I, the main message I want to convey through my whole talk is that ALAC works very hard to use science-based standards in a performance-based approach to harmonize not unify, to harmonize standards of animal care and use around the globe so that animal welfare is improved and so that the quality of science is enhanced. And I hope that I will be able to illustrate that for you over the next few minutes. So ALAC is an international organization. We have been since 1996. And I've been with ALAC 20 years and have watched the world of science changed dramatically, as have most of you in this room, and one of the predominant factors that has changed is this increasing connectivity among researchers, among laboratories, collaborations between universities, outsourcing of work to CROs around the globe, and certainly multinational authorship on a number of high-impact papers. All of that, of course, I think, depends on some understanding of the quality of animal care that is provided to the investigators and the procedures that they engage in with those animals and that those are somehow in a manner consistent, at least at the quality level. They don't have to be consistent in, in technique, uh, but they should be consistent in quality. So ALAC's role then through our accreditation program is to improve animal welfare and by so doing re refine the animal model and in so doing provide more reliable data for the investigator. Of course there are challenges associated with that. Uh, as we go around the, the globe uh, we, we encounter sometimes quite significant cultural and communication and philosophical differences pertaining to the care and use of animals. However, if those institutions want to play in our sandbox, they have to uh, accommodate our standards, and I think that is having a very positive impact around the globe. Uh, so some of the things that th come out of that, of course, are them having to look at what are the care Im impacts on data, what are the numbers of animals that they're using, are they just using too many animals, are they right-sizing the, the project. And of course they have to look at their research methodologies because ALAC wants some sort of oversight system in place that evaluates the proposed research. Now, we, we could go around the world with our own biases and our own perceptions of how that should be done, but, uh, and, and perhaps be the ugly American, if you will, in doing that, but we are an international organization, and we then want to use the international language of science in accomplishing that goal. The point being that if we're going to be looking at standards that are of value in one country and suggesting that they be applied in another country, there should be some objective basis for that and scientific data, notwithstanding the irrepro irre irreproducibility that we're talking about today, uh, scientific data, in fact, at least is a 
key driver in those decisions. In our estimation, science is objective, objective, verifiable, and based on facts. And I don't know why my pointer, there we go. So here's our mission statement. We are a voluntary accrediting organization. I think most of you in the room know this. Uh, our goal is to enhance the quality of research, teaching, and testing by promoting humane and responsible animal care and use. We do provide advice through our education and outreach sessions, uh, independent assessments when we go on site to review the animal care and use programs. And those institutions that participate in our program have to at least meet our minimum standards. That's not to say they can't exceed those standards, and in many cases, organizations do exceed the standards that ALAC sets. And therefore, there is probably some variability that one might see, uh, but everyone is at least meeting our minimums. I thought Lita and others in the academies might enjoy this image, the original name of ILAR, Information on Laboratory Animals for Research. And this is an old publication out of the National Academies of Science, National Research Coun Council back in 1965, announcing a voluntary accreditation program. I thought it very fitting to show this image, which is in our ar archives, uh, because of where we are today, and because it set the stage, the fact that this was taken up immediately by a very strong scientific body, evidences our long-standing partnership with research organizations. And our 14 founding member organizations are located on the right, some of whom are still with us to this day. So our ALAC founders recognized that consistent high-level research animal care would, in fact, benefit science, and that input from the scientific community was going to be essential to accomplish that. So we already start seeing back in 1965 the threads of thinking that science is the common language for animal care and use, that that is the international language for establishing standards, and that this partnership between the veterinary community and the research community was going to be quite critical to that success. So the Animal Care Panel is, uh, was the original um, b body that ultimately became ALAS, and so Bob Disco, here's my tribute to, to ALAS and to your role there. Um, they published in a 1964 report, as part of the scientific community, the Animal Care Panel has been working to define the conditions of animal care, which promote sound and proper animal experimentation. So it was mentioned earlier today that this is not a new issue about making sure that the animal care is appropriate for the science. I want to predate what was described earlier. I'm going to take it all the way back to 1964. And that this will not proceed, uh, that the animal care panel cannot and will not proceed with this program, i.e. accreditation, without the consent and support of the scientific community. <coughs> so that ILAR newsletter uh, back in 1965 then says, the ALAC has been organized to promote a program for the accreditation of laboratory animal care facilities which will encourage, promote, and facilitate scientific research which includes the use of experimental animals. So again, my preliminary point, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, ALAC has been founded in science from the beginning, guided by science throughout, uh, and I wanted to illustrate that by noting that our Board of Trustees member organizations, and I'll show you a long list in a moment, uh, are predominantly scientific organizations. Uh, they represent toxicology, agriculture, neuroscience, transgenic technology, and, and many, many other disciplines. Other members uh, on our Board of Trustees represent veterinary medical, patient advocacy, science advocacy, and industry or academic interest groups. And the body that actually goes out and does the uh, assessments, of which Dr. Edwards is one of them, I believe he's our only council member in the audience uh, today, um, approximately one-third of our members of the council on accreditation hold a PhD. So who are our ALAC Board of Trustees members? We are currently comprised of 69 
organizations. 40 represent research disciplines, about 17 are veterinary or animal science specialty groups, and then I mentioned the others make up the balance. I did want to note that we are increasing our representation of international organizations with our globalization. The alphabet soup is, is not so important as, except to say that these are various lab animal science organizations located in Asia, Europe, the Korean College of Lab Animal Medicine. Many of you are familiar with ICLIS, the International Council on Lab Animal Science, and ANSCART comes out of Australia and New Zealand. I'm not going to um, point out any specific organization here, but the length, I think, is impressive. And um, as I say, with 69 member organizations, we have truly a broad scientific input into the accreditation program. And we are very proud of the fact that we have these organizations as our partners. ALAC has several core values uh, which we think will lead to a high quality accreditation program. Science, of course, being uh, preeminent among those, but I've already mentioned animal welfare, the fact that participation in the accreditation program is voluntary. Uh, that it is a peer review process, so we, we customize our assessment teams to meet the scientific and animal species uh, characteristics of the institution we visit. Um, it is our core values are that we are try and make them collegial, uh, confidential, and our reports need to be accurate. Former council member uh, Dr. Ron McClellan and former chair of our board of trustees made, made this quote or stated this quote about whether ALAC is an evaluation or an inspection. And we have two federal agencies represented in the audience who, in fact, um, probably have a, a, a more inspectorate-like uh, process than we do. Because we are a nonprofit organization, we are not. We are an evaluation. Uh, and as Dr. McClellan said, the accreditation process is a communication-intensive program of evaluation and support stressing application of performance standards and professional judgment rather than inspection and enforcement of engineering standards. We do look at the entire program as defined by our three primary standards of which the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals is one. Uh, the agricultural animal guide is the second and ETS 123 out of the um, European community is our third and all four all three of those have essentially the four, same four components, the fact that there are administrative responsibilities at each institution and policies that are derived from those responsibilities, uh, the actual animal environment, its housing, the management of the animals, the veterinary care program, and of course, the physical plant. And ALAC evaluates all of these. Now, ALAC is um, not without its detractors. Um, and they come from a variety of, of uh, platforms. The, um, I think, most recent is coming out of the National Science Board, where um, there were some quotes that ALAC is considered burdensome by the institutions. And that's a different discussion for a different day. But I did want to um, point out another quote out of this report, because it's really a fascinating and really well-written report. And it's probably going to be hard to see in the back, so I'm just going to read to you that the report says, one of the recommendations out of the report is that um, we should be developing standard operating procedures and a single set of guidelines that can be cited on IACUC protocols. One of the overarching themes was that uh, part of the problem of doing science is the administrative burden. So if we are asking our scientists to produce more reproducible data, something has to give, and they are feeling an inordinate amount of burden, administrative burden, um, just from having to deal with IRBs, IACUCs, uh, and all the other ancillary administrative tasks that they have to deal with. So while ALAC cannot provide this particular recommendation, we can't fill this mission, we can, in fact, again, start harmonizing, working with institutions to harmonize so that um, we can ensure the scientists have the time to do good quality science and that they're not distracted by other administrative burdens. So, of course, I wasn't here yesterday, so somebody probably already showed this quote, and I apologize if that's the case. Um, but if 
many of the failures in reproducibility uh, are in fact due to simple and practical explanations such as different animal strains, different lab environments, or subtle changes in the protocol that perhaps have not been reported back to the IACUC or other oversight body, then this is a role, again, where ALAC can um, have some influence. So there are a number of organizations, another alphabet soup, if you will, uh, that are all working toward the same goal, working in harness together uh, to harmonize animal care and use standards around the globe. I already mentioned the International Council on Lab Animal Science. They have uh, issued some recommendations as to guidance documents that would be useful for many countries to adopt in terms of oh, training of personnel, transgenics, uh, humane endpoints, a variety of really relevant topics. The International Association of Colleges of Laboratory Animal Medicine, which was Bill White's brainchild, and I think he's probably still in the audience today, um, brought together all of the colleges of lab animal medicine around the globe, so again, they could partner and uh, try and again, harmonize how lab animal veterinarians are working in their environments and um, make some progress in trying to assist lab animal veterinarians in helping the scientists. I've already, you know, obviously, ALAC International, my, my employer, the World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, uh, and SIOMS, the Council on International Organizations of Medical Science, I'm going to speak about just a little bit because these are two really quite influential international bodies that publish standards and principles that many, many countries are adopting. So if you go to our website, um, and the red arrow shows where you can easily link to what we call reference resources. These are documents, mostly scientific or um, sort of consensus documents that the Council suggests institutions use in framing their animal care and use programs. There are a number of topics uh, on the reference resources, but I'm going to focus in on the tab that's general. And you'll see the two arrows show that ALAC has formally adopted the OIE's uh, Chapter 7.8 in its Terrestrial Animal Health Code, which has to do with the care of research animals, as well as the International Guiding Principles for Biomedical Research, the SIOMS Guiding Principles that um, have just recently been revised. Is that five minutes? Okay, and I can do it. So I, I think what I'm trying, again, the bottom line message is proper care and use leads to better quality science, leads to more efficiencies in how we use our animals, better uh, papers produced, better data produced, and faster development uh, coming out of our, our research projects. I think that you can go on our website easily and, and to this tab and see what, um, what we've been told by survey. This is not ALAC's quotes. These are coming to us from others. But um, I do want to, to comment especially on the fact that we do concentrate on promoting continuous improvement to a global benchmark. That's the harmonization piece that I think will draw all scientists around the globe together. And it promotes scientific validity for publication in international high-impact journals by minimizing experimental variability and promoting reproducible quality data. And if you wonder how successful the program is, uh, these are inst institutions by percentage participating in the ALAC program that were immediately conferred full accreditation uh, after the meeting of our Council on Accreditation, and you'll see over time that number is hovering now around 90 percent. So what we are seeing is the global nature of science uh, is being enhanced. Uh, this, we are already recognizing and have been for some time the scientific imperative for reproducibility of results, the transferability of those results, and their statistical vi validity, and that animal care is a very dominating scientific variable that ALAC can help correct. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Margaret. Catherine will be open for questions at the panel. Our next speaker is Stuart Zola, and Stuart comes from Emory and had been at Yerkes for many years. So, Stuart. Thanks, Margaret, and uh, thanks for having me. I'm actually going to step away from the microphone. I'm just alerting the uh, video people. I'm going to have to step away from the microphone because I'm going to do something here in front of you. Um, I'm only going to 
to say a couple of words. You can hear me in the back, right? We have to have a microphone for the Here. webcast people. Great job, Jerry. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to feel useful. Usually they have tutus on, but uh, that's uh, all right. All right. This is just a quick demonstration. I think that captures the essence uh, essence of the meeting, uh, <clears throat> and it's a demonstration that involves three pieces of rope: a small piece of rope, a medium-sized piece of rope, and a very long piece of rope. Now we can think of these three pieces of rope as three laboratories doing experiment A. So laboratory X comes out with this result, laboratory Y comes out with this result, and laboratory Z comes out with this result. They're doing the same experiment and yet they come out with very different results. That's this question of reproducibility. What we're really aiming for, of course, is a very different outcome, and that is the outcome where all three laboratories come out the same. It doesn't matter if it's laboratory X or laboratory Y or laboratory Z. When they do experiment A, they all come out the same. don't really have a lot more to say uh, other than uh, this and that was meant to be provocative so reproducibility is the missing R and the question is uh, and I think it might be worth discussion and maybe you had some of this discussion yesterday I apologize I couldn't be here yesterday um, and, and that is how much uh, are we overemphasizing this are we creating an issue that may not truly be an issue or are we pushing it uh, much further than it needs to be pushed so that the media grabs it and then we lose control truly of it. That's a, a, in the world of science a real problem and I think we need to be cautious about that. Uh, I want to just say, uh, give you a little bit of background of the National Primate Research Centers and then uh, indicate some of the things we're doing to try to heighten uh, the ability to uh, um, come together in terms of research projects so that uh, Laboratory X, Laboratory Y, and Laboratory Z really can actually uh, do the same things together. One of the uh, kind of caveats that a colleague of mine, Larry Squire, used to be fond of saying uh, is that scientists would rather use another scientist's toothbrush than use another scientist's test. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's a caution that we have, and it's part of the culture, and it's part of the culture we really need. You know, people will create their own versions of a test, and that may uh, tweak things sufficiently so that um, we don't get uh, necessarily the same result. This is a map just showing uh, the location of the eight primate centers. As many of you know, the Harvard Center has uh, uh, decided to uh, close uh, down, and so uh, it's in a process that will end this year. Uh, there'll be seven of these National Primate Research Centers. The centers themselves uh, are located in uh, this distribution here. We are several synapses away from the office of the director. Uh, we're in a division of program coordination, planning, and strategic initiatives, deep Poughkeepsie, for those of you who are NIH people. Uh, office of Research Infrastructure Programs is located in deep Poughkeepsie, that's ORIP. And the Division of Comparative Medicine is located in the Office of Research in Infrastructure Programs, that's uh, the DCM. And then finally, the Primate Center's program is located in the Division of Comparative Medicine. So we like to say we're in the Office of the Director, um, but as you can see, uh, we are several synapses uh, uh, from Francis. Um, we are really a uh, global resource as well as a national resource. Each of these uh, centers um, uh, does not just work in its local region. It works both nationally and internationally. Uh, so we have collaborative projects that are done throughout the world. Um, they're done in a couple of ways. Either individuals come to the center to work at the center 
or we establish a relationship with that laboratory and we do the work uh, together in collaboration with the researchers at the uh, laboratory uh, long distance. Uh, this is, uh, in terms of the Yerke Center, my center, um, the kind of thing that happens every day um, on the left-hand side. Uh, we just have an enormous range of areas that we do research with non-human primates uh, on. I should mention, by the way, that we have more than just non-human primates. We have uh, rodents as well. In fact, we have many more rodents than we do primates. Um, and uh, other species uh, also. So it's, although we are national primate research centers, uh, we understand the need to have other kinds of species. And the notion would be, uh, and I think uh, there was a sense that Jeff was describing uh, toward the question and answer period, of being able to link more and more species together. Because if you can reliably show the same phenomenon across species, that gives a great deal more credibility to the uh, to the phenomenon itself. So we are certainly interested in being able to branch and uh, bridge with other species as well. On the right hand side, I'm sorry, on the right hand side uh, just shows our kind of uh, um, daily populations. We have about 3,200 non-human primates. Uh, we have on any one day about 450 faculty, staff, and uh, students. Um, that includes a lot of postdoctoral fellows, a lot of graduate students, undergraduate students, et cetera. So uh, these are big operations uh, carrying out a wide range of, uh, of uh, work. Um, this slide just uh, accentuates some of the things that were in the previous slide um, with, uh, with some pictures. Uh, <laughs> what I want to uh, really uh, um, almost end on is the um, new developments in the uh, National Primate Research Centers, and that is this website. This website is almost ready for prime time. It will be, um, we believe, by the end of this month, and we will be able to distribute the website uh, for everyone. Um, but the point of that in terms of our present discussion is that uh, this is an access site for all of the National Primate Research Centers. We've come together in a consortium. Uh, and the focus is to try to help and assist investigators who are looking um, for particular kinds of animals, who are looking to uh, initiate research in a particular area. So this is just a, a splash page from uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, pages in the site. The point here simply is uh, we have all of the research that goes on across all of the centers, uh, and then we've indicated for each center whether this is really a major area of research, so we have major experts on site, uh, or an area of research that does get carried out. These may not be the major thrust and focus uh, of that particular center, but you can tell uh, on this chart by just uh, uh, typing in whatever area of research you're interested in, and this will lead you to all of the centers where you have a primary focus and all of the centers where there may be some additional supplementary individuals or people uh, who can help. Um, we have it by um, animal species as well. So uh, here is the, uh, the species, and again, the centers. There are some centers that um, have many species, other centers really focus on a single species and they are the world's expert for, the, for that species. Uh, so you can uh, sort through uh, that way as well. We of course have um, animal welfare concerns as a very high priority for us. The stewardship of animals is uh, for us uh, one of the most significant things that we can do. That is our currency in trade is being able to demonstrate and, and uh, um, with some credibility talk about uh, our ability to maintain and manage these animals in the most humane uh, and most uh, um, scientifically applicable way. So we spend a great deal of time on aspects of animal welfare. Um, I'm proud to say we have just received our uh, new accreditation, ALAC accreditation, um, uh, and uh, we're um, have been accredited for um, uh, some very long number of years. <laughs> Is there? Yeah. Uh, this uh, did not turn out right in the transition here, but at any rate, this was supposed to be a uh, 
a um, form that uh, we complete at the institution if we have an outside investigator who does respond to these charts and is interested in looking at a particular animal species or a particular study. Um, we assign a uh, appropriate investigator to that individual and that individual will work with the outside investigator to develop and map out the research program uh, and uh, go through all of the aspects that will be needed for the IACUC and for everything else, including all of the statistical aspects, including issues of that we think are important in terms of reproducibility. So all of those things are available at the centers. We have experts uh, there at each center who are able to uh, manage that. Um, we just want to uh, end with a couple of slides that come not from uh, my resource but from another. This is an a, a article from Toxicology Sciences and it's possible that you heard about this or saw this yesterday. I apologize again. don't know but this is from Gary Miller uh, who just put this out for his journal. He's the editor for Toxicology Sciences. And this is one of those kind of clever statements uh, that uh, is meaningful in the long run. You know, if A causes B, then these are all the conditions where we ought to be able to see A causing B, no matter what these changes are, even if it's during finals week or March Madness or during the World Cup, which is a big deal in, uh, at Yerkes. We have a lot of international people who are on the, watching the World Cup all the time when it's on. Uh, but the point is that um, all of these variables that we talk about and that I think Francis alluded to in some ways, uh, as uh, that we have to be cautious of are things that uh, turn out to be important. One that was uh, also raised was this issue of the level of significance, the level of certainty that we have. Is 0.05 really enough? Uh, should we be aimed at a more rigorous kind of level of certainty for the future? Um, and that's something that uh, we may want to talk about or perhaps uh, has been uh, discussed uh, already. I'm not going to um, point to that because it's already been said by all of the uh, journal editors that are here. Um, this is simply the last uh, slide indicating, uh, intending to indicate the kind of difficulty of the connectivity of all of the things that have to come together in order to get a study off the ground. And it looks like you can't actually read this very well. I can't see it very well on the screen. It just didn't translate to the computer very well. But the point simply is there are a number of different areas of expertise that all have to come together to create a successful experiment. We have tried with this uh, website and are aimed at uh, the Primate Center's uh, consortium for being able to have all of that expertise in place for anyone who wants to use non-human primates uh, in research for a very, very wide range of uh, areas. Uh, and we would welcome um, uh, you collaborating with you. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, I should actually do this trick again in terms of reproducible. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> this is a conference of reproducibility. The last speaker in this session before we get to the discussion is Jerry Collins. And Jerry, this information's up there, and I know he'll have a lot to tell us and teach us. I always find it scary when somebody says that. Um, I just want to thank the organizers for uh, allowing me to be here. Um, every once in a while, somebody asked me why I went to Yale to do a postdoc and never left. And the reality is that it very early on became apparent to me that I was going to be surrounded by a lot of people a whole lot smarter than I was. And the reality is yesterday and today is the same. So thank you very much for what all of you have helped me do, and that is to better understand the seriousness of the problem uh, that the scientific community faces right now. These are some ideas that I picked up during the session yesterday. One of the advantages of speaking near the end is obviously hearing what others have to say. The disadvantage is a lot of what you were going to say has been taken up. But I do want to focus for a moment or two on these first two. Do not waste animals and wasted resources impact future opportunities. When we think about the IACUC process, it is clear that one of the assumptions that is made is that the process itself will help to reduce the likelihood that animals are going to be wasted. I find the second one especially important. Uh, I have two grandchildren, two little girls, three and about 14 months old. Um, and when I think about the 
advantages that their lives could benefit from if we reduce the wastage. Uh, it clearly becomes a very personal issue. The third one, an institution has duty to have annual reviews, issues like blinding, statistics, etc., um, is one that troubled me when I heard it yesterday only because when I hear the term institution as it relates to animal care and use, I immediately assume that that's something else that's going to be put on the shoulders of the IACUC. Uh, and my personal feeling is that the IACUC as a committee uh, is already asked to do a remarkable job uh, that extends beyond pretty much any other degree of uh, regulation or, excuse me, not regulation, oversight uh, that other entities at an institution would be asked to do. And then finally, efficient regulation. I think that's a great idea, but as Catherine pointed out from that recent report, as the FDB told us, um, we recognize that a challenge that our colleagues face today is simply meeting or clearing the hurdles that the regulatory processes put in their way. Uh, just very briefly, think about a pediatrician. She takes care of patients. She does human studies. She works with animals. She uses radioactive materials. She uses some select agents. Uh, and then think through the hurdles that that individual has to clear on a regular basis in order to be able to actually get to the job. The top one, I think, Jeff, you may have expressed this, improving science and welfare can go hand in hand but should not be interlinked. And I'm going to give away my sense of what I think the iCook role is. The underlying portion is my effort to try to express that, and that is that improving reproducibility is a cultural issue. And by cultural, I mean the culture of the scientists, our community that we belong to, not a regulatory issue. And I want to try to strengthen that a little bit by going back to the documents that were responsible for the creation of the IACUC because I believe they give us some useful information to think about what it is that IACUC has in fact been charged to do. As you all know, there are two separate agencies, the USDA and PHS. In both instances, there was a law, the Animal Welfare Act or the Health Research Extension Act. That law said certain things should be done and then there were either regulations or a policy developed in order to say how that implementation should occur. And then in addition to that, within the PHS policy, there were two other documents that we needed to attend to as well. So these documents give us a good, quick overview of what it is that I believe an IACUC is responsible for. The USDA, the Animal Welfare Act, so the law that Congress passed, it was passed in order to provide humane care and treatment. And in the standards and certification process, again, humane handling, care, and treatment. A con continuing theme here, this was the concern at the time in 1985 when these laws were passed that there be some way of guaranteeing that the animals that are used in biomedical research, teaching, and testing are in fact being treated humanely. And then again within the act, there was to be a committee, and that committee is the IACUC. PHS, the Health Re Research Extension Act, again, the law itself says that Congress wanted to make sure that there would be proper care of animals used in biomedical research and proper treatment of those animals used in biomedical research, proper care and treatment of these animals. And a committee needs to be formed. So we have the basis for the formation of the committee and we're told what it is the committee should be doing. This is my sort of little thought when people ask me what an IACUC should do. I firmly believe that an IACUC is responsible for overseeing everything that could have an impact on the health and well-being of the animals that are being used. And in smaller print, a lot of the things that could have an impact on the health and well-being of the humans that are working with those animals. So having said that, we now need to take a look at these two other documents, that is the guide and the uh, U.S. government principles. Because PHS policy tells us that, in fact, the policy is intended to implement and supplement those principles. And if we take a look at the principles, many of them focus on humane animal care and use, appropriate anesthesia and analgesia. But as the discussion uh, led yesterday morning, it also, I believe, points out the importance of having a risk-benefit analysis conducted as well. The procedures involving animals should be designed and performed with due consideration of their relevance to human or animal health, 
the advancement of knowledge or the good of society. So I believe that in addition to making sure that the animals are well cared for, we also need to make sure that there are valid reasons for their use. And then PHS policy, as you all know, says we have to attend to the guide as well. And the guide in the most recent edition tells us that although scientific merit is normally reviewed as being outside the iCook, committee members should evaluate scientific elements of the protocol as they relate to the welfare and, again, use of the animals. Things like hypothesis testing and sample size and group numbers, things that we talked about or we heard about yesterday. So if we then take a look at this additional responsibility, it strikes me that the iCook is responsible for doing everything it can to make sure that there is appropriate humane care and use of the animals in a facility, in a research area. In addition to that, and there's a debate about this among investigators, a lot of my colleagues say the iCook should never be involved in any scientific review, I would argue that there is a component of what the iCook does that can only be done by attending to the science. And I think it's addressed quite nicely in these, these two statements here. There are some things about what we are told an investigator wants to do that could have either a positive or a negative impact on the well-being of the animals. And as part of the iCook process, we are responsible for making sure that that happens. Now, as it relates to why we're here today, this is kind of the, the tough piece for us because some could argue, well, okay, if in fact the numbers justification needs to be correct, then the iCook should get involved in looking to make sure that the, the proper statistical uh, procedures have been, have been applied. We can maybe talk about that uh, in the discussion. I want to go over the iCook functions because either these are exactly the same in 9 CFR and PHS policy. And it's a quick review of what it is that the iCook can be doing and where it's possible for a positive impact to occur. You're familiar with these. Review the animal program. Basically, everything is going to be looked at on a regular basis. Inspect facilities, the same. Report issues, part of that process of a semi-annual review. And then review animal care and concerns make recommendations to the I.O. about any aspect of animal care, so basically be a colleague interacting with the I.O. Six and seven, these are the protocol review, either the initial or the modification, and finally eight, suspending an activity. These are the eight specific functions that are identified in the two documents that basically tell us how to do what it is Congress wanted us to do. And I think it's important to recognize that these functions are well defined they are very broad, and I would be troubled if we suddenly added additional functions onto this list without some very careful consideration of the implications. One, two, six, and seven, I think, are where the iCook has an opportunity to make sure that the critters are okay, but also to perhaps contribute as an, an additional aspect of that to reproducibility. Reviewing the animal program. We heard this morning issues like feed. So we want to make sure that things are as consistent as they can be across the board so that the variability as a result of what's happening within an institution is minimized. The same thing with inspecting facilities. And then with reviewing the protocols, we clearly need to understand why it's being done. Are there controls? Does it seem appropriate for the individual to do the particular experiment that he or she wants to do at a given point in time? I believe that the humane handling and care treatment of animals contributes to enhanced reproducibility by providing a level of standardization if standardization is what we want, but more importantly, it's also meeting an essential societal mandate. I believe that a well-functioning iCook process may contribute to scientific reproducibility, but it is not now and should never be in the future considered an additional mandated function of an IACUC. And I'll finally finish. This was actually going to be my finished slide. A lot of you had talked about it. This is the paper that we're hearing a lot about where it's possible that male versus female uh, investigators running the studies may have a, an impact upon it as well. And with that, thank you. I look forward to discussion. Um, well, we have about 45 minutes for discussion, and if we get done a little early, we will continue because we're going to try to finish a little bit early. So 
Um, Kent, who's done an amazing amount of work on this program, has enough time to summarize and catch his plane at the same, same time. So our three speakers are up here. You know, part of the session was um, they represent the veterinary community, IOs and IACOOKs. And as the title of the program said here, it's trying to see if we can work with internal regulators um, to be partners in the reform as we've been discussing on reproducibility. So while people are thinking of, of some questions to ask, and please come up to the microphone, some of the comments I've heard um, during lunch and all are, um, some of them are sort of a do, what I call doomsday approach. Well, it's, it's, it's obvious we're doomed for more regulations, that the only way we're going to change this problem is to have more regulations put in place. Uh, and, of course, as a, as, a, as a community and a culture, I think, that's not necessarily the solution that we would want to jump at. So, for any of the panelists, do you have any thoughts or comments on that? I was hoping that question would be asked. Um, <laughs> you didn't even ask me. <laughs> no, not even a ringer question. If we look at that brief example I used of the pediatrician, and we think about the impact that that has on the process of science, um, adding additional regulatory requirements, I believe, will simply make it more difficult for people to do their jobs, number one, and number two, will reduce the likelihood of them doing anything other than filling in the paperwork and then going off what they're really doing, what they really think they should be doing. But beyond that, I think it's, it's essential, uh, as I sat here yesterday, truly naive to an awful lot of how things really were, uh, it struck me that what I was hearing was what I noticed as a graduate student when we did our journal clubs on a Friday afternoon over a cold beer. I think I mentioned this to a few of you folks. Um, we have, I think, an opportunity. My sense is that there is a come to coming together now of a critical mass uh, to recognize that there are some very basic portions or activities within the scientific method that simply need to be focused upon and regulating them will not help. Uh, we need to make sure that education occurs. Uh, my personal view is that uh, at the other end, at the publication end, there's an opportunity to require that in fact uh, all of us do a better job of providing the information that's necessary. So. <clears throat> You know, when I was a um, postdoctoral fellow, um, there were three laboratories, actually Laboratory X, Laboratory Y, and Laboratory Z, <laughs> that were uh, doing very much the same work on the same experiment. We were trying to understand the um, neurologic basis for recognition memory in the brain and what parts of the brain were important for recognition memory. And the three laboratories came out with somewhat different ideas about which parts of the brain were more important and what the computations were that were being done, even though we were all doing recognition memory experiments, recognition memory studies. And so we all came together one day <clears throat> and decided that uh, we should be talking more to each other than just through our papers uh, and really trying to sort this out. And then we came together and we actually did publish a paper that um, sorted out exactly what the parameters were that were different across the studies and why those made a difference and it turned out we actually learned a lot more from that uh, exercise and science benefited from that in being able to more clearly delineate what the memory system was of the brain uh, given all that. If we were regulated in some ways it's less likely that we would actually have the opportunity to go through that exercise if we can't fail in science or if we can't um, not reproduce things in science, that is not, in my view, necessarily a healthy way to go forward. So I think we have to be very cautious, and I, I really meant it when I said really uh, in the title of that talk, that um, in my view, again, I think we need to be very cautious about how we proceed uh, in terms of science. You cannot legislate science. 
um, it really has to work its way out. We have to recognize that there's a problem, and we, and I see that little three lab experiment as a kind of microcosm for how science ought to be working. And we recognize it, and we eventually came together and solved that problem to the benefit of uh, each of the labs as well as hopefully to the benefit of uh, society because we now understand a lot more about how memory works. Um, I would be much more worried about imposing some kind of regulation, which I can't even imagine in terms of what that regulation would be, for the IACUX to stop experiments from ongoing uh, because um, we hadn't somehow anticipated um, this, uh, this failure. So that's what I would say. And glad to engage in that conversation. Oh, I hope I can be provocative. <laughs> I concur. I, I, I tried to make the point, I hope successfully in my talk, that scientists are already feeling overburdened by administrative workload associated with the conduct of research. If we dilute their efforts even further, how can we then expect them to perform at an even higher level of, of reliability, reproducibility? I think it's, it would be way too challenging, and, and the National Science um, Foundation's report certainly implicated ALAC as one of the uh, potential burdens that is being imposed on um, researchers because of the standards that we would like institutions to adhere to, although I would say that it's probably more likely the internal people interpreting ALAC's uh, view of the world rather than ALAC's view of the world. Uh, be that as it may, it's a, it's a real perception out there and one that ALAC tries very hard to, to um, contravene because we do believe what we are trying to do is help facilitate high quality science. So I think voluntary accreditation, I think letting the scientific community, the statistical community, the lab animal veterinary community partner together to try and resolve this and move it forward is really a much healthier approach than having more regulations imposed. All right. So the man who needs no introduction, since you've introduced yourself three times. And I had help. And you had help. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> uh, so thank you. That was a, a really interesting panel, and I really appreciate the points you brought up. Um, I, I want to ask you um, a little bit about um, the issue of transparency, because I think that's an extremely important thing. And from my perspective, as somebody who has represented regulated communities, that is one thing that I know is very key to public acceptance and understanding. Um, largely, the system that governs us is a self-regulatory system. And uh, as a self-regulatory system, there have been a lot of efforts put into making sure it works well. It doesn't mean it's perfect. It doesn't mean it functions successfully every time. But because it's a self-regulatory system, it's often very hard for members of the public to get information about what, what's working and what's not. So my, my question to you, and then I want to make one comment because I, it wouldn't be complete if I didn't do both. My question to you is, how can we improve transparency which, by the way, is a wonderful motherhood and apple pie concept, but has consequences. But how can we improve transparency and let really people understand what this system looks like, what this regulatory system looks like, so that there is a better exchange of information? The second thing, and, and I'm willing to be pilloried for this question, and probably will be, is uh, something I've never understood is um, I came to science because I was always interested in collecting data, analyzing the data, and having that data available so it would help me make decisions. Um, we don't have a key piece of data. We don't make available a key piece of data in the United States, and that is the number of animals we use for research. So my question is, is that something we should do and we shouldn't do? And as I said, I'm more than willing to be beaten up about that question because I know it's a controversy. It's a simple question, but it's a complicated answer. So thank you. Can I, can I just jump in about the animals <laughs> number? Because one thing I've learned, and, and there's enough people from Europe here to correct me if I'm wrong, but when I've looked at animal numbers from Europe, they come from like how many animals used in industry, how many animals used in academia, how many used by the government. They're not by institution, whereas I think in the U.S., most of those conversations would list them by institution. 
And I think if they're, if they're, if they're collated by industry categories, I don't think there's much of an issue, which is what they do in Europe. If we're talking about, and I just like Paul to clarify, if you're talking about per institution, that's different than there is in Europe, and I'd just be interested in your thoughts. You have um, analyzed the, the issue at a much um, more detailed level. I'm just asking the general question, why can't I as a, I'll give you an example. I was writing uh, an article the other day and um, I got feedback from a peer review, surprising. Can you tell me how many animals are used in the United States for X, Y, and Z? So you're talking at the higher level. Yeah, so I'm just talking about why can't we as a community get that information out? Okay. Sorry, panel. If I could just address the uh, transparency issue for a second. Uh, I think yesterday I, I said something to the effect that I don't think the media is the way to do it. We need to be talking to our friends and neighbors, and I believe that's honestly the case. Um, we as members of the scientific community need to be comfortable with talking to others about what we do, and we need to help them understand that there are rules and regulations in place, that they don't always work, but that the people that are working under those rules and regulations, for the most part, are people that are committed to what they're doing and recognize the importance of humane animal care. You can't say that in a news article. I mean, you can, but I don't believe that the impact is the same because my experience has been it really only makes sense when it's a person-to-person -person contact. And absent that person-to-person -person contact, I think it's, uh, it's fluff at the best. So I would really second that motion, Jerry. We, um, at the Yerke Center, we do an open house twice a year. We bring several hundred people into the center uh, on a Saturday morning for a couple of hours for tours. They get to see uh, many animals. They get to talk with uh, the scientists. Um, they get to understand that this is a center in their community that is one of only eight centers in the world. Um, they are quite proud of having that center with them in the community. Um, they understand a lot about what happens. They don't understand necessarily or want to know, even in terms of transparency, what the particular parameters are for recognition, memory, delay, you know, but they want to know why we doing what we do. Uh, and we really help them to understand that so that they, people come back every year. Um, we do this now, in fact, for the last two years, we had to do it three times a year because we are oversubscribed. We've never had a single uh, incident with animal rights activists. This is the general public. These are our neighbors uh, that live down the street uh, from the center and all the zip codes around the center. That has turned out probably to be one of the most important things we have ever done in the decade or so that we have started, we, we started it. Um, this, we refer to it as emotional banking. It's emotional banking with the general public that pays off so grandly when there are issues or anything that the media tries to get hold of. We send them right to the neighborhoods and say, go and talk to the neighbors if you think this is a challenge or an issue for us. Uh, and they just come away with very positive kinds of stories or they come away and don't do the story because it's not newsworthy in the end. Um, so I think, Jerry, it's exactly that. The personal approach to this transparency is uh, really vitally important. And we do the same thing with Congress people, by the way. We, in every opportunity, when they're back in Atlanta from Washington, they are out at the center. So. And, and might I just add that for those of you that are on an IO cook, you should probably do the same thing with your I.O. because frequently the I.O.s don't really have a good sense of what's actually being done at their own institutions. <laughs> Can I add one point to that? I'd like to roll together your points about transparency and animal numbers reporting because I, I think as a taxpayer, everybody's entitled to know where their ta tax dollars are going. Um, but I think bare numbers don't tell the story adequately. and. I remember a paper that I was very struck by that the Sixth World Congress by an Iranian scientist who said we should also have global reporting of the three R's. So I think a, a numbers story sometimes, just the bare bones numbers, don't tell the complete story. Whereas if the numbers were put in some kind of a context, that adds to the transparency. So here we have X number of animals used. Here are the refinements or reductions 
or replacements that have been implemented in this reporting period. And here's the progress that's being made. Here's the output uh, in summary of the use of those numbers so that we're not just looking at the, the raw number, but that it is put into some context which really is transparent but also serves to educate. Well, I would agree with uh, your comment, but I, um, I had another spin on it, if you will. Uh, I think reporting the three R's will be just subject to fallacy. There's no way we can even estimate that, at least I couldn't, and I've been in this field for a long time. Uh, but I do think that the numbers should have a denominator. And so the question is, what is the denominator? So if we use, let's say, a million mice, how many mice are there in the world? Or if we use, what, 1,000 monkeys or some number like that, that is disposed of, how many rhesus monkeys are there in the world available? The, the numbers we use for research are trivial when you look at the populations available on these. Same with dogs, by the way. So I, I think we should be careful because the numbers won't mean anything otherwise, just to send out a number. A different sort of context. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Gail Hi, I'm Galen Edwards, University of Georgia. Um, at Experimental Biology this year, we conducted a, a session on regulatory burden. And um, unfortunately, it wasn't that well attended, although we, I certainly hear a lot about it back on my campus. I'm sure everybody here does as well. One of the items that came out, though, was self-imposed burden. And I really didn't hear any of that from the panel. I would welcome any of the comments you might have. And, um, I personally see lots of self-imposed burden, and we, we work hard to try and keep from doing that, but um, your comments would certainly. Uh, I, part of the ICOC 101 faculty, as we go around the country, one of the things I try to hammer home is that frequently the ICOC is the greatest source of regulatory burden at an institution. Uh, and I'm guessing Catherine's going to pretty much say the same thing about ALAC. I think the reality is that, that um, I believe an ICOC needs to take both responsibility for what they're doing and recognize the authority that they have and use that as it applies specifically to their institution rather than saying, well, gee, down the street they're doing this, so maybe we should do it too. Or, gee, Great East Eastern University was referred to in a recent publication as doing why, therefore we should probably do that too. We really need to make sure that what's being done at our institution is under federal regulation and we know why it's being done, and we know what information we're getting as a result of it. So you're absolutely right. I would agree. Um, again, my beloved council member and another former council member here, they, y'all, y'all understand the ALAC perspective. Um, Nelson Garnett, Pat Brown's predecessor, used to say from the podium all the time that institutions impose more burden on themselves than come from ALAC, OLA, and the USDA combined. Uh, in ALAC's case, uh, we do have a saying called the ALAC Club, where someone at the institution decides they need something. They need a new rack washer. They need IVCs. They need um, more environmental enrichment. And what they wind up saying to the people who authorize the funding is, well, if we don't get this, ALAC's going to cite us. And so that gets out in the lore of that institution that it's ALAC uh, making them, it is ALAC that is making them do something, go purchase something, spend money on something, change a procedure, when in point of fact, as I've tried to illustrate, we're using a performance-based approach and professional standards, professional judgment. So in fact, we allow a variety of ways to achieve the same high quality outcome. And I think that the ALAC club is used rampantly around um, not only the United States but around the world for institutions and people at those institutions to garner something that they want changed in their program. Just to say there's a little more personal approach to that uh, in the sense that an investigator will often over um, regulate themselves when they're preparing the IACUC. So they will indicate that, um, I'm just making this up, 
the animal will be observed 14 times a day uh, as opposed to, you know, two times a day. And so they're, uh, they're going to violate that. There's, you know, they're going to paint themselves into a corner that they will violate. So it's important, and uh, hopefully the Iacocks do that, um, and uh, I know that's the principle at least, is to not overburden uh, yourself, uh, but to do something closer to performance uh, standards uh, as opposed to engineering standards even in the Iacock view. Yeah, I, I really want to second that that last comment. We deal with investigators all the time that, that give us this, you know, really rosy picture of what they're going to do. It's impossible for them to do it. You know, we're going to inject analgesics every two hours for 48 hours. No, you're not. It, and you don't need to do that. And um, It's really important that people recognize that. The other extreme is where they say they're going to give 0 .002 milligrams of a drug, and that's it. And they don't give themselves the useful expected range, and as a result of that, they're out of compliance, too. Uh, Michael. <coughs> yes. In uh, the UK, of course, we're heavily regulated, and we have inspectors who inspect, I think, unannounced, maybe three times a year. But the culture is such that they're not really looking so much for infringements as to find ways that things might be done better. And so they are they're experienced people, they see lots of different laboratories, and they're sometimes able to say, look, there's another laboratory doing it better than you're doing it, uh, with permission, can we put you two in touch, and this sort of thing. So they are helpful, and it's a culture of helping rather than the culture of seeking infringements. That's very, very important. And I would argue that that's really the key to success for an iCook as well. Uh, it's difficult to do because there is a hurdle there, but the reality is that when done well, when the people involved with an ICO recognize they are providing a service to their colleagues, then there is the opportunity for uh, that same kind of a process to occur. And I would second that uh, as well. You know, we have this expression, we have this compliance officer, but his job is just as you describe. It's not to discover things for the sake of discovering things and, and getting a violation. Uh, the notion really is um, to keep us out of trouble instead of get us out of trouble. That's the idea, is to get the first thing in place rather than the job being the second thing afterwards. So. I think one thing that's important is kind of to, to look at some of these things. There, there are a million variables uh, in any given in vivo experiment, but not all variables are equal. And some of the things we're talking about are basic good experimental design practices as opposed to the fact that Michigan has pinworms. You, you know, <laughs> you, some things don't affect lots of research in big ways. Um, and you know, I, I think that we need to look at what is major, what is something that every experiment ought to report as opposed to what, what are things that impact animal research and what's practical. Um, you know, just how do you count mouse, mice in a facility? You know, I spend a lot of time with mice in my facility, but if Margaret were to come to me and say, I've got to know how many mice you have in the facility today, that's not an insignificant task, just defining it. Is it individual animals? Is it litters? Is it, you know, animals weaned? And if you want constancy across institutions, that's going to be something that's going to take, you know, a round of international meetings to come up with how do we count mice? And um, it, it's an important practical, you know, question. So some of these things to the public seem real simple. We should know how many animals we have in our facility, but it's not such a simple question on a practical level. And that's what's happening to investigators, and it's counterproductive. So I have investigators, lots of investigators that are in a state of learned helplessness. They don't want to think about their animal program. They just want, just tell me what hoop I have to jump over. I'll jump over it as fast as I can do it. You know, I'll try to satisfy you. But they're not engaging their brain to really become engaged in their work. And I think the important thing is to try to self-regulate. I think that's why ALAC works. It, it's not a governmental regulatory program. It's you know, a group of, you know, collegial interactions trying to make a program better. And I think that's why the IACUC works in many cases when you have an effective IACUC. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of good in the UK in their, in their programs. I think, you know, personal licenses have given a culture of responsibility we don't have in the U.S., but I've also seen a lot of bad out of the U.K. home office where people are worried because it's a bunch of government regulators. So it puts, you know, uh, it, it's not really a, we're here to help you. You know, that anybody that believes the government's here to help you, you know, you're going to instill some fear. 
and uh, it, it just it, it can't work the same way at every institution. I think it has to be customized, but I think that has to be realized. Susan Silk and I had lunch, and I said to her that uh, it struck me that the important and in some ways low-hanging fruit that was focused on yesterday um, has been diluted by the wonderful science we heard about today. I mean, it seems to me that they're almost two different worlds. There are some very specific um, good practices that need to be part of the scientific method that need to be tightened up, and that clearly has to happen. And then we have the world of biology that we all recognize will be introducing variability uh, that will, from time to time, make it difficult to repeat uh, an experiment. And we need, I think, to keep in our heads that, that clear separation. Well, um, even though there's no other questions, I'm going to reopen the animal numbers question. Paul, you may stand up again if you so wish. Um, because uh, some of you know I work, um, I don't know if I introduced myself, I'm Margaret Landy from GlaxoSmithKline, and I work internationally and primarily the U.S. and U.K. And I don't know if it was Michael or somebody yesterday showed how an, the animal numbers in the U.K. went from animal numbers to animal procedures. And procedures uh, is tied to if you're breeding an animal, the number of, you know, breeds that happen, the number of offspring. Um, and I, in fact, while I've been here, I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten within my company about animal numbers and how do you count? Do you count, you know, litters? Do you count procedures? So representing the American public, um, you know, my feeling as a taxpayer, people want to know animal numbers. Procedures is more of an abstract notion. And I understand why it's counted, because one animal, in theory, could be used more than once. Um, in reality, that's not a huge amount, but it, it can, in theory, happen. But, and as I think Barbara said, you know, it's, you need, need both a numerator and denominator. It has to be in relationship to something. Gross national income? I don't know. Into, into something, <laughs> amount of money we spent on health care. Um, so uh, I'm not trying just to drag this out. I'm really curious, and I think I can't, can't be the only one because I rarely have unique thoughts. <laughs> what you think about that space, or anybody else who may want to comment? Well, when I asked that question, made that comment, I said that it was a very simple question and it had a very complicated answer. So I think I proved my point. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, I wanted to explain maybe why I'm coming to ask this question. And the reason I'm coming to ask this question is because when you talk about the regulatory system, you're always, to some extent, talking about public confidence and what mm -hmm. the public knows and if the public thinks the system is working. And um, I think that doing a good job explaining that is really key. And while it's great to engage the neighbors and it's absolutely important to get the IA cooks out as um, sort of advocates for what they're doing, there is a broader public discussion that has to happen. And one place that could happen is around more information. The public seems to like information. So that was why I asked the question, because I think increasing transparency, Increasing what people know about how things are done increases confidence in the regulatory system. So I, I can't say that I have you know, um, any particular great answer to your question. I think very good issues were raised about numbers. But I think the fact that the US doesn't do this and the rest of the world to some extent does, maybe they have imperfect systems, that to me is an interesting issue. Um, Bob Disco, University of Michigan, pinworm distributor. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, I want to echo what Jeff said um, earlier in that I, I understand the, the sort of taxpayer-based need for, you know, I really ought to know how much is, you know, what's going on and what the numbers are. The real complication, though, is to be able to create that for people at a moment's notice is going to be a big deal. It's one of the advantages we've had, so to speak, of not having rats and mice and fish covered by the USDA because we don't have to publish that number. And for those of us that count our mice and rats based on cages, then that adds another factor of, and so it's certainly how precise does 
the number have to be? And I think there are broad estimates out there that you would be able to use to give to the public to say, we, you know, the country uses X amount or our institution uses a, 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 you know, a range. But to try and hone it down to the details, you know, and then start saying, oh, how, you know, how do you count the pups and all that sort of stuff, that's going to get crazy. And uh, so I think any way that, you know, we could make it as loose as possible would be the best way to go without having to make people start, uh, you know, counting noses. Just to say there, let me just respond to a little bit of it, but so there are public, um, there is public access to numbers. So Society for Neuroscience, for example, will be able to tell you, at least in the field of neuroscience in general, how many animals of what species are used for neuroscience research around the world, more or less. Um, USDA, we're required to file with USDA uh, all of our animal numbers for any of the procedures that go on and what our population of animals is. And so that's accessible by various mechanisms. But I would argue that I, th I would suggest you're wrong. You're simply wrong about what matters to the public. What matters to the public is them having, a, the public having a sense that the stewardship of animals is of primary importance and that we are doing work that is important to the welfare of the nation and the, the welfare and health of the nation. That is what it, they want to hear. When they come and visit, they do not want to see a table of numbers. Trust me, they don't care how they, in general, how many animals we have. Yes, 3,000 animals here. Oh. What are we doing with those animals? That's what, they, well, that's what matters. So I would not place such emphasis on the need to know animals beyond this very kind of rough estimate. You know, we can say with uh, some real precision at Yerkes, yes, we have 3,200 animals. We know how many females we have. We know how many males we have. We know the species. But that's truly not what they're interested in. And they're not going to walk away from that open house with that number in mind, they're going to walk away from that open house. <laughs> These guys are actually looking at Alzheimer's disease in non-human primates as ways to study memory and to understand what parts of the brain are important in non-human primates. That's, in my view, what matters, and that's the story we should be telling them. Uh, I don't care what the denominator is. That's not what Congress really cares about. They want to know what the cure rate can be from the work that we're doing. Yeah, um, can, can, can I just clarify how this is worked out? You do an experiment with 20 mice. At the end, you kill the mice and you record that you've, you've used 20 mice. Then at the end of the year, you put on your form that you use 20 mice. Okay, so it's only, only the animals that are actually used in experiments. And then the other thing that the public cares about is they suspect there are lots of secret things going on. Okay, and that's, that's what they're concerned about because you're, it's all covered up. So really what they want to know is it needs to come out in the open and what is going on and can it be justified? And if, they, if, if everything's secret, then they're concerned. I thought about how do you count the 75% of the wild type genotype that aren't relevant to the 20 you killed? And do you count those of weaning at pups, individuals? How do you count for that? Yeah, any, any genetically modified animal that is bred is a procedure. So yeah. you have a procedure that's got 50,000 animals in your breeding colony. It's not the number of animals in the breeding colony, it's the number of animals you produce. But it's yeah. Okay, Jeff, Michael, procedure. Jeff, Michael, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were going to get done early. We've got about 10 minutes, and I think you, your points are valid, but there are a few more people standing up. And I saw Pat raising her hand, and though she's not, uh, you know, first, I'd like to I just Pat. want to respond to the taxpayer comment that um, – NIH does fund biomedical research. We do not fund specifically animal studies. We fund science. Some applications that get approved and get funded may involve animal components, clinical studies, basic bench science, everything about those. The transparency is there. If you go to the NIH reporter website, you can pull up information about each grant, see who the key individuals are involved with it. There's a summary of what the um, science is all about. And there's citations resulting from those, those, every single one of those grants. 
There's information about patents that have resulted from those grants. It's all there for anybody who cares, and you can also search by keywords. So if you want to see everything that's involving chimpanzees, you can do that. So um, public stewardship of, of the funds that, that come from NIH is, is very valuable. Uh, we are, have always been seriously concerned about it, but it's not broken down by how many animals are used. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I've lost track. Who's next? Jilly, I think. Yes, I probably regret saying this, but um, <laughs> I'm from the Canadian Council on Animal Care, and so I'm the director of standards there, and under my um, responsibilities are the, is the animal use data for Canada. And uh, so I think, um, at least in Canada, you know, the public does care a lot about the numbers of animals. And I say that because I know how many times I have to answer the phone. Um, I usually say that I write guidelines so that I don't have to answer the phone. So in order to be sort of transparent, we, we publish animal numbers. We also publish categories of invasiveness, so the sort of amount of pain and distress that the animals not have experienced, but that the animals have the potential to experience. That's the way it works in our system. And so that's something that the public cares deeply about, is the amount of pain and distress experienced by the animals. They also care about the species used. So I can tell you that I get a lot of questions about the numbers of primates used. I get a lot of questions about dogs and cats, whether there's a purpose bred or whether they have come from random sources. And there's a, you know, usually the misconception that uh, animals have been uh, still, that animals are being pulled off the street and are being used for invasive procedures. So in trying to be as transparent as possible, we've also sort of m most recently um, put together a, a big data sheet uh, so that people can do their own sort of analysis, if you like, and you can drill down via species, via category invasiveness, and via purpose of animal use. So you can tell how many non-human primates, for instance, were used in regulatory testing um, at um, le category of invasiveness level D, just as an example. I take people's point that it's, it's a lot of work, and of course I have to deal with the grief coming from institutions uh, when they, you know, they're trying to fill in their forms. We've tried to uh, give a standard form so that it's easy for people to fill it in and send it to us, and then quite honestly it's easier for us to then suck it into a big database without making any mistakes. It is a lot of, of work, and yes, we do have to do things like, you know, making, making fairly clear rules about how we're going to count animals. Um, so I was kind of smiling when people were asking questions about, you know, how do you count an animal? But uh, I, I think there's payoffs. Um, and I just wanted, there was just one other point I wanted to make, actually, that our granting agencies asked us to use that animal use data in order to show um, our effectiveness, so to try and, and, and give metrics in terms of the three R's. I think that's really difficult. That's something that I'm really struggling with at the minute. And I uh, was quite struck by the NC three R's who came out and said, no, you can't use animal use data in order to indicate your effectiveness in the area of the three R's. I'll stop there. And I hope the panel doesn't mind. We'll just go through the questions, and then we'll see how much time we have. Um, Lynn. Yeah. Hi, Lynn Jackson again. Um, I agree with Jeff and others that counting animals can be very complicated. Um, I just wanted to share one other tidbit of information as a veterinarian who worked in the Re Republic of Cambridge, Massachusetts for many years, <laughs> where we have city laboratory animal ordinances that govern what we do. Um, and what we are asked to do in the Republic of Cambridge on an annual basis is to provide the total numbers of each species of animal that have been purchased within the calendar year, as well as provide the average daily census for each of those species of animals. Clearly not a perfect system, but it's pretty easy to do for most institutions. Okay. Didn't know there was the Republic of Cambridge, but there you go. Uh, Eric? Hi. Uh, Eric Arlen, Solmark Innovations. I'd like to try to take this topic of animal population size and bring it back to reproducibility um, by saying, and I wish we knew the number, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a 10-year-old publication that puts the number upward of 20 million, but we don't know what that is, and I understand that, but we know that it's a lot. And yesterday we talked a lot about um, 
reproducibility and statistics and blindness and randomness. And the question that I run into a lot is, could not a lot of the irreproducibility come from the fact that the data builds from individual ends and when a data point comes from a mouse that might not have been the same mouse it was a week ago or the last time we took that data, could not that be contributing to the errors in the data that we're, that we're dis dis discovering? Do we rely just on the research technician to know how they're identifying those animals? Um, or do we want the additional staff to be able to help identify those animals? And this becomes more complex when we consider collaborations, how animals get moved from one institution to another. And as I think about CRISPR and how that's going to mean that I could come to a research institution and in two months have an animal model for my gene of interest, perhaps, without even having time to get training in how to take care of animals and how that's going to expand into other species as well. That, that we, I don't feel we have a good enough control over how we identify those individual ends that build up our statistical analyses. I don't know if people have thoughts or comments on that. Panel. We have, we only, only have about, I, I, think, I think you've stunned the panel, Eric. Yeah. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I have no candy to throw at you, so uh, maybe during afterwards there'll be some conversation because we just have a couple minutes and we'll have one last question. So as a postdoc, I had the great pleasure to take care of our animal colonies. And I actually had to breed animals to genotype them. So I knew exactly how many animals I handled every year. Uh, even the pups, like everything was reported and was accessible for IOCOOK for review. So, and I think it's important to, as a scientist, not to consider mice and rats because they're not part of the Animal Welfare Act, to consider them as disposable material for experiments. And I think it's the responsibility of the lab to make sure that the scientists, the students, the postdoc, whoever is taking care of animals, to make sure that they understand that we're not talking about SHUs, we're talking about animals. And having more emphasis on reporting those numbers, I think will set the bar a little bit higher in terms of how scientists are designing their experiments, how they're thinking about the use of those animals, what is going to be the purpose. I've seen a lot of grant proposal going out and heard, let's put 300 rats. So at least we know we'll have enough. If we need to do you know, preliminary data for another grant, we can still use those one that will be left over. And it's not appropriate. To me, it's like, this is not the goal of your experiment to put 300 rats. So if you lose 50% because the experiment doesn't work, you can still redo the experiment another time. Like, it's just like, so forcing like people to, I don't know, be a little bit more uh, responsible of the animals that they handle. And I mean, we have to report, you know, the use of animal to USDA for like all other species. So. Um, and there's the different columns for pain and distress and how they're used. So um, it's a little bit more work, but I think at the end it will be valuable and maybe valuable for reproducibility of data as well. I would suggest that the scenario you described uh, suggests to me that possibly there's a dysfunctional iCook. The iCook needs to make sure there's a reasonable justification of the numbers. And if at the end of a three-year period or a one-year period there are numbers left over, there needs to be a way to know what those numbers are and make sure they aren't being just used, but rather are somehow credited. There's a, an additional justification for using them. So at the local level, with a well-functioning iCook, there is an important role to play in watching the animal usage. For example, I think I'm going to get you know use a thousand animals to get a hundred but I only get five. The iCook needs to be going back and asking, why did you only get five? Is there a problem with the process? So I agree with you completely, but I would suggest that in institutions where the iCook is functioning well, that problem shouldn't exist. All right, well, we're right on time, and I think that was a good question to, an to end this session. I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, and uh, we'll move to the next session. Thank you.